Welcome to Southgate. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I just want to make sure that uh, if you are joining in with us today, that you are connected with a local church. Uh, we hope and we pray that if you're in the North Grenville area, that you are connected to Southgate in a physical way, that you are coming out to services and you are joining in on the events that are happening in person. And if you're wondering how you can get connected to some of those things, uh, we would just say that you could sign up for the email uh, that uh, goes out weekly as well. You can follow us on our socials and uh, check in on the website to see what is going on in person and in our community. And so uh, we want you to be connected in that way. And uh, if you want to participate in what we are doing by giving financially, that will be up on the screen. We hope and we pray that this service is a benefit to you and your walk with Jesus. So as we move into summer, I'm sure that a lot of you are getting ready for summer vacation. Some of you are maybe even planning uh, some trips. I remember when I was a kid that we would frequently take a summer trip uh, out east to go visit uh, some family in New Brunswick. And I always loved these trips because what we would do is we would pack up the van the night before and then at about three in the morning, uh, we would all get out of bed, we would pile in our van, and then we would take off on our adventure. And what I loved about this is I would just close my eyes. We were leaving from uh, Perth, and I would close my eyes in Perth, and then I would open my eyes, and we would be somewhere in Quebec, and I would be like, well, we're not there yet. So I would close my eyes again, and all of a sudden, we are in New Brunswick, and it's such an easy trip. I don't know why everybody doesn't make it themselves. And if you were to ask me as a kid, how do you get to New Brunswick? I'd say you climb in a van, close your eyes twice, and you'll be there. Um, that was how I saw that trip going. That's how I saw my transportation happening to uh, New Brunswick. And so that may seem like a, uh, a, a weird story to begin this series as we talk about the summer in the Psalms, uh, but I promise we're going to make the connection here. And maybe some of you are like me. Maybe some of you grew up going to church, hearing about the Psalms, even reading them every once in a while, but never getting much out of it. Uh, you maybe know a few things about the Psalms. It's the largest book in the Bible in terms of chapters. It's smack dab in the center of the Bible, which is why we probably think that it's larger than it really is. We, every time we open it up, we're, we're opening to the Psalms. Whenever you get one of those pocket Gideon Bibles, it always has a New Testament and the Psalms and the Proverbs for some reason. Every time you go to do a Bible reading, uh, one of those yearly plans, you end up having a Old Testament reading, a New Testament reading, and a Psalm. Uh, you may even know that it's not really a book. It's actually a collection of five books, each of those books containing a collection of poems. So it's a collection of poem books 
within a book of the Bible, which is a collection of books. Talk about layers of inception here. Maybe some of you even wonder, what's the use in the Psalms anyways? Why do we have them? And, and what good are they really? And it's my hope that today and throughout this series, that we are able to open up the Psalms and gain a new appreciation for them. That we can begin to understand what some of the thinking was behind putting these poems together and why so many people have had a profound and powerful experience with them. First, we need to understand that the Psalms are unique in the Bible in a couple of different ways. Number one, there's, there's no narrative, uh, nor do they fit into any one narrative. One scholar put it this way, the amazing fact about the Psalms is that though they were born out of a particular, particular life experiences, their content is remarkably devoid of any references to the particular events which brought them into being. See, a lot of the times we, we can gather from context or maybe even from the title of a psalm what was going on. But when we read the psalm itself, it's very general. It's talking about, you know, my enemies are coming up against me, but it's not talking about which particular enemies or uh, talking about God's praise or things like that. We, we don't see from the psalm itself what those particular events are because they're meant to be applicable to a broad spectrum of experiences. The Psalms span from about 3500 BC to 2500 BC, which means that uh, it has the longest time period for composition. Moses is recorded as one of the authors of a psalm, and most scholars would agree that there are some psalms that were written after Israel's return from Babylon. This also means that there were likely different iterations of the book of Psalms itself, which is probably why we have five different books contained within the book. Uh, and like we said, it is made up of five books in its final form. Most likely, this is corresponding with the books of the law, the first five books of the Bible. But one of the biggest things that we find when we take some time to study the Psalms is that it was largely meant to be a vehicle to transport us to the temple or God's presence. See, when we open up the Psalms, we are, are greeted with a fantastic piece of literature in Psalm 1. And, and we could say many things about Psalm 1, and perhaps as we go through this series, we will take some time to do so. But for now, let's read uh, just the first portion of Psalm 1. And I want to draw your attention to a few things that are underlined here. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that the sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law. And so what we see here is that allusion to the fact as we open up the book of Psalms, that this is meant to encompass all of scripture for the Israelites. The law itself was meant to be summed up in the Psalms. This was meant to be a reaction that we have to God's good law. And who meditates on the law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Now, what is this giving us imagery for? What, what do these images remind us of? Yes, of course, the garden. This is giving us an image of the Garden of Eden. 
And, and many of you might be thinking that, well, that's not a temple. Or is it? See, the reality is that Eden was planted initially as God's temple, the place where heaven and earth would meet. And this is why it became so profound that Adam and Eve were actually removed from God's temple and there was cherubim put out in front to block the entryway. And if you look at the descriptions of how the temple was to be built in 1 Kings 6 to 7, it is littered with garden images like flowers and trees and fruit and angelic creatures. It was designed to be the place where heaven and earth meet once again, where God will meet with his people, just like the garden was the place where, where heaven and earth meet and God meets with his people, so the temple would be the place where heaven and earth would meet. But here's the thing. Not everyone had access to the temple. Whether it was distance and geography, some people just lived too far away to get to the temple on a regular basis. Or maybe it was distance in time. In fact, most of the Psalms that we have gathered are either for David or written by David. David never actually got to see the temple, but he longed for the temple. See, it was either too far or it didn't exist or for some people it had been destroyed. Much like the temple was to be a place where the Israelites could be transported back to the garden into the presence of God, so the Psalms became the place where the Israelites could be transported back to the temple, back to the garden, into the presence of God. Take for example, the conclusion to Psalm 73, verses 23 to 28, they, they read like this. Yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge, and I will tell of all your deeds." This experience of the presence of God is the purpose that we find in the book of Psalms. But, but many of you might be asking, well, why, why do we have poetry? I don't know about you guys, but poetry isn't necessarily my thing. Well, it's not always my thing. Uh, see, when I was young, we, uh, we, we got to do a really fun project in uh, my grade eight poetry class where we got to examine songs and address them as poetry. And I realized how interested I actually was in the power of a song, in the power of poetry to take me somewhere new. See, poetry has the ability to conjure up images that narrative or prose discourse, which is the majority of the Bible, they do not have the ability to do that. See, often the reason many of us don't connect with the Psalms, if indeed that is your struggle, it's because we're reading them wrong. We're combing through and we're looking for a nugget of truth or what some people call the coffee cup verse, something that, you know, it's got some great inspiration and you can just slap it on a coffee cup and it's going to sell like crazy. You just take it right out of context, throw it on that mug and, uh, and see the money come in. No, we're actually meant to take these in as poems 
as a whole and get lost in them. That's why, in all honesty, no sermon is truly going to do it justice. This has to be something that we practice, something that we do. And believe it or not, it's something that we do practice, actually quite often. Now, we use modern psalms, but every Sunday when we gather, we sing songs together. And it's meant to achieve the same goal the psalms do, to transport us into the presence of God. Tremper Longman puts it this way. The purpose of the psalms, however, is not to argue, persuade, or convince Their purpose is to confess a profound faith in and love toward God. See, often we come to the Bible and we say, convince me. We come to the Bible and we say, I want to be convinced of something today. The reality is when we open up the book of Psalms, it's not looking to convince you of anything. Instead, the invitation of Psalms, the invitation that God is giving us is not come and be convinced. It's come and experience me. Come and experience my presence. Now, if you're new to church um, or you've never been to church or you've just seen some clips of what goes on in worship services. You may have noticed a few things about people when they worship, especially if you've ever participated in a more charismatic church service. Often people have their eyes closed and they're doing things with their hands and it it might seem weird or maybe it just feels like another concert to you. But I want to take some time to talk about how we engage in worship music and how it's similar to how we will encounter the Psalms. That these are some practices that we can take the spirit of and apply them to our reading of the Psalms. And so we're going to ask the question, how can we get the most from the Psalms? First, I I, I think what we need to do is we need to free ourselves from distraction. You may have noticed that, that many people engaging with worship will close their eyes. This is the same reason we close our eyes when we pray. It's to remove distractions from us. Now, obviously, it's not always helpful to close your eyes like If you're praying while you're driving, probably a good idea to keep your eyes open. Or it's not a great idea to close your eyes while you're reading the Psalms. Okay, so, but what we are going to do here is we're going to take the spirit of that, the idea that comes behind why we close our eyes, why we remove distraction from us, because we actually want to be taken somewhere else. So, uh, clear your mind of distractions, whether that is uh, finding the right place, or maybe it's putting music on. I know that for myself, there's actually only certain kinds of music I can put on while I'm reading, especially the Psalms. I can't have anything with lyrics. Uh, It has to be something instrumental, usually something a little bit more calming, But if I'm going to put on music, that's what I'm going to do. It's going to be distraction free. I'm going to try and find a place where I know I'm not going to be interrupted. Sometimes it's even helpful to to make a time, a time where, you know, maybe it's dark out and you can actually focus light. You can find a place where the only thing that you're going to be able to see are the words that are in front of you. Whatever it may be for you, I'm not trying to make something prescriptive here, but rather I hope that we can get this heart of let's remove distractions so that we can be taken somewhere else. The second thing would be surrender. 
Again, you may have noticed in worship services, there are times where people will have their hands lifted up. Both hands lifted up. Now, this is the universal sign for surrender. This is, this is a symbol of vulnerability. I'm not, I'm not here to control anything. I'm not doing anything. You can see everything here. I'm very vulnerable. This is a sign of surrender. And again, I'm not saying that we need to take that approach when we are reading the Psalms. I can imagine you sitting there with your Bible on your lap and your arms raised up. It might be the weirdest roller coaster ride you've ever been on. <laughs> But again, we are looking, we are looking here to take the heart, this idea that we approach the Psalms with surrender, that we approach these, uh, these songs of encouragement with surrender, whatever we need to do to take on the posture of surrender. Maybe we need to kneel. Maybe we need to take a moment to pray a prayer of surrender before I engage with these psalms. I'm going to surrender myself to them. I'm going to surrender myself to this experience. Wherever God wants to take me, that is where I will go when I encounter the psalms. And third, we need to see ourselves as children we need to see ourselves as children again sometimes you'll see somebody raising one hand up and literally this morning before i was heading out to work my youngest eli as he ran up to me he held out his hand he was reaching for me this is this is often what we are doing the posture that we are taking when we worship God and we raise up a hand we are reaching out to our father and asking him to take us somewhere very similar posture to surrender but it's incredible uh, when was the last time that you saw yourself and truly perceived yourself to be a child of God it is incredible to know this. Many of us know this. We know that we are children of God, but to experience it is something different. And it's something powerful. And let me give you an example. The past couple of weeks, we've been, uh, as a family, we've been kind of watching uh, the new, well, not the new, it, the, the, it, I guess it's a couple years old now, uh, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. And uh, it's this incredible take on uh, Spider-Man. And for those of you who know, there are many different kind of origin stories for Spider-Man. And this one in particular focuses on Spider-Man whose alter ego is Miles Morales. And in this iteration of the story, he is empowered and strengthened by the love of his father. Seeing his identity as a beloved child of his father drives him to do what he needs to do. This is a powerful thing when we understand ourselves as beloved children of God. And when we approach the Psalms with this posture, with this attitude, it's incredible the places that our father who loves us will take us. And lastly, we need to be ready to receive. Sometimes you'll see people with their hands held open like this. It's a posture of receiving. I'm, I'm ready to receive whatever it is you want to give me. And when we, when we open up our hands like this, it's similar to taking a posture of surrender. If we approach the Psalms with the intent of receiving something, we're, we're not thinking that, that we're going to come up with all the answers. We're not thinking that, hey, I'm going to open this up and I'm going to find the answer to this question that I've been looking for. But rather, I want to receive whatever it is you have for me as a gift. Ultimately, worshiping like this, engaging with the Psalms like this, it requires a fairly high level of vulnerability. And this is why for many, 
They will not see the use in the Psalms. Which is unfortunate because the reality is that it's not enough that we just know about God. We need to experience him. And it's in experiencing him that we are transformed. I want to put this out there. That today, maybe, maybe today is the day that you decide to be vulnerable. To put yourself out there. To experience God. To have an encounter with God in a way that transforms you. So today, we've just got two simple next steps. Number one is this, engage in worship. You know, the, this was meant to be a message about Psalms, but as it was kind of unfolding, I saw that this was, this was an opportunity to talk about worship and to talk about how we experience God and to talk about the postures that we can take and the places and positions that we can take to truly engage with worship. And the key is this, that we've got to be vulnerable. Okay, and so we move on to uh, number two here. Engage in the Psalms. We're going to be spending a significant amount of time this summer engaging with the Psalms. And I want to encourage you, maybe, maybe all that it is, is you pick one Psalm for the summer and you keep going back to that Psalm. And, and I want to see what will happen as you encounter God in that psalm. And maybe you encounter him in different ways, at different times, in different places, as you engage with the psalm. And maybe it becomes something that is written on your heart. Something that, that you ultimately, you go back to time and time again to experience God. Allow yourself to be transported somewhere else. Allow yourself to be moved into the presence of God. Let's close in a word of prayer. God, I thank you so much that you have given us an opportunity. You have given us a vehicle through which we can be transported into your presence. And I pray, God, that, that as we engage with your word as we engage with the Psalms, God, that, that our hearts and minds would be open to being transported, to finding ourselves in a new place at the feet of your throne. God, I pray, I pray that we would be able to see ourselves as, as surrendered, see ourselves as children of God. I pray that we would be ready to receive from you. And I pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen.